walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Testimonies. Testimonies. Richard. Good. How's Dot doing? Don't, don't want to interrupt you, but give me an update. How's Dot doing? Good. He's out of work. Man, he's a truck driver. How do truck drivers get out of work? What's the matter with you guys with CDLs? Huh. Someplace I saw CDL drivers advertised this week here in the Oxford area somewhere. Huh? Yeah, that's where I saw it. There's two or three signs outside the road. CDL drivers want it. Hmm. Okay. Poor dots all by herself then. Who? Her tenants. Oh, I didn't know she had tenants there. See how much I don't know? Okay, now now finish your testimony. I'm sorry. Gap Fire Hall? What did you do at the Gap Fire Hall? Huh? What'd you buy? What'd you buy? A rhubarb strawberry pie? <laughs> rhubarb strawberry? Oh, well, if it's rhubarb strawberry and you didn't bring Carolyn a piece, you're going to put the hex of Ali Bob and the 40 Thieves on you. Huh? Somebody else? Shirley? Amen. How does that poem go, Autumn? <laughs> they that think, they that something. But anyway, I invited her to church because I, I told her the address was on there. Looks like she didn't show up today, but I have her phone number. So Amen. Phone number, so Amen. <laughs> you can be like that persistent widow in the, in the Gospels. Keep calling, calling, calling. Somebody else. That's good. Good. We testify. People get tired of me testifying to them. I think the doctors and the nurses up at uh, Coatesville at the VA every time I check in or check out I'm inviting that one girl she's all messed up with Jehovah's Witnesses and I'm trying to get her to come down to church and, and there's a, another nurse up there and a doctor or not a doctor but a male nurse and he's different too But so pray for all those folks we get a chance to just drop a seed here and there pray that it will get watered and, and fruit will come I uh, have been reading online of a guy that I have heard of that have never met him. His name's Ken Blue. And he start, he's been starting some very interesting discussions amongst preachers on, um, on Facebook. He asks these uh, questions that can really be very um, divisive or, or what? Profitable? Thought provoking. And the, he was talking about churches and growing and, and type of churches that do what and how you make a church grow. 
And he was saying that some churches think that they can only grow by soul winning. In other words, getting people to go out door to door, cold door type, con confrontational type soul winning. And I, 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 my thinking is this, and I've always told you this, I'm for any kind of witnessing and evangelization that you want to do. If it's a track, you put a track out. If you get a chance to talk to somebody that you know, you talk to them. If you want to go to your next door neighbor and around in your neighborhood and, and knock on doors, that's great too. Any way we get the word out is a good way to win souls, in my opinion. We need to stop being so picky and divisive over stuff like that and just major and, and focus on what we're trying to achieve, and that's getting people saved. So any way you can do it, that's the way we ought to do it. I brag on you, Shirley, because that's how the, one of the first things I noticed about you when we first started the church, Gap Diner. Went there to eat one Sunday, and there was our bulletin tacked up on the bulletin board. Because back then, I used to challenge folks to give our bulletins away. Because if you give the bulletin to a friend, you're giving a tract, plus you're introducing them to the church. So give your bulletins away. It's a good thing to do. Somebody else, Janice. Another Rebecca. <laughs> but she's a little autistic, so everybody kind of shies away from her. And I got to find out that she was a Christian. She went to Bible school, went to Bible college. Good. And What's her name? I don't know the last name. Where'd she go to Bible college? Now you've got to point it to me. It don't matter. I thought maybe she went to Northeast, not North from up there. Just curious, what does it cost to put a child in the daycare you work at for a week? Which classroom? Uh, uh, Thirteen month old. In my room. Is that your room? Okay. Two hundred and thirty-six dollars. Talk to my daughter, will you? Why? Because they have no concept about what child care costs them. <laughs> they talk no concept about what child care. I, I don't mean autumn. Two hundred and thirty dollars. There you go, Carol. Huh? A week, yeah. That's a week. Well, some sometimes anymore they get subsidies for that. I don't know how all that works. They make within a certain Right. Yeah. Okay, another testimony before we do our next song. Miss Louise. What would you say, Sherry? What would you say, Gloria? That's, that's one step closer. Anybody else? Kathleen. Good. Amen. I told you not to worry about it. They're not going to close those types of programs down. Fear tactics that people use sometimes when around election days and uh, I, I'm going to say this, and I know people get tired of hearing it, but we really need to pray for our nation. The, this deal with Trump, there are people in Washington, D.C. that do not want Trump to have any victories at all. And you and I are not up on things enough on that um, health care bill to know whether it was good or not. But I'm up on health care bill enough to know that I've seen too many die because of Obamacare and the misuse of the funds in those situations. So getting rid of that, my thinking is I would just tell them repeal the whole thing and go back to the way it was before Obamacare and then take their time, start from scratch, and put together a good health care bill that they can work on. Uh, we, we have seen people in our church that were denied treatments because it cost a little more. You had to have the least expensive one first to see if it would help, 
And then by the time that one did not help, it was too late. They couldn't do anything more. So we really need to pray for our country. And not to, now listen, when I, when I talk like that, I'm not, I, I, I'm not a Trump uh, supporter in everything about his lifestyle. Not at all. But I'm saying that our government is so fractioned and broken that the establishment, in my opinion, in Washington, D.C., does not want to be threatened. And I believe Trump is a threat to them. He does not want to sit around and play games of politics like they want to do and still do. So we really need to lift up our country in prayer. That's my opinion. You're welcome to differ with it if you want. I'll even give you time right now for rebuttal. More Nancy Pelosi would give you, but that's okay. Anybody else before we sing our next song? Okay, 237. Let's do the first and the last. Oh, now I see the crimson wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, points to his wounded side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amazing grace tis. Jesus crucified, the cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. And number 27, Andrew's not here and we're doing his favorite song. And again, we'll do the first and the last. Would you want to lead this one? You used to. Yeah, but no, you did better. Of course, you were 14 years old then, but 15, yeah. But you did a good job. First verse. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. For a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the cross, the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down, I will cling to the cross, the old rugged cross, and exchange it someday for a crown. Miss Autumn, are you singing tonight? Janice has tonight? Okay, Miss Janice, you're singing tonight.
Annie smiling, saying, thank you, Janice, for remembering her. 1 Peter chapter 1 tonight, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses here, and then we're going to talk about a subject that's nestled right in between two of the major doctrines of this section. Uh, verse, let me see, let's start in verse 18. For as, you, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and the glory of man is the flower of the grass, uh, the glory of man as the flower of grass. Uh, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So we see three major doctrines in this little section. Who can tell me what you see as the very first one? What does it speak about first? Uh, kinda, salvation. But what specifically? Specifically, the blood. Look in verse uh, 18 or 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, this is one, in my opinion, of the cardinal doctrines of Scripture that you cannot mess with. And too many of our modern, of the modern, not our modern, the modern so-called Bible translation delete the blood and the references of the blood and they replace it with death. And when you bring it up, people say, well, you're just picking and choosing. That's just not important. Of course it was the blood, but Jesus died to shed his blood. Yes, that's true, but he could have died and not shed his blood. He could have been strangled. He could have died of a heart attack or old age or cancer of the liver or the pancreas or any other cancer problem. Uh, he could have been run over by a wild team of horses pulling a chariot, but he was not. He was crucified that his blood might be shed and be taken to the Holy of Holies in heaven and sprinkled there on the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat that the book of Hebrews tells us is in heaven. To me, that's a cardinal statement. You cannot get away from the blood of Christ. If you take the blood of Christ away, it's like the joke that I make about that song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? You take the blood away and you have to sing that song, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing. Because it's the blood that cleanses us from all sin. It's the purity of the blood. It's the blood that God intended as the final once for all sacrifice. And you cannot get away with that. Now there's a second one mentioned, and the second one uh, is mentioned down in, let me see where I've got it now. It's mentioned down in verse, um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, the resurrection is there, but there's another one. Uh, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, but by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. These, you hear me preach on these two doctrines often. The blood of Christ, you cannot play with it, mess with it. You cannot play and mess with the word of God. If you take something that is pure as the Bible is and truthful as the Bible is, and you change it, it then becomes corruptible. But I want you to see something that's nestled right in between those two verses in verse 22. In the last part of that verse, it says, uh, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 
Just as important, and we don't look at it this way most of the time. Most church members, if I ask them for three important cardinal doctrines of the church, they would tell me the blood, they would tell me the, the book, they would tell me the blessed hope, they would tell me about the virgin birth, but how many folks would put the love of the brethren on a par with the incorruptible word of God and the precious blood, also incorruptible, of Jesus Christ? And yet in this passage, Peter puts them on the same level. Loving the brethren is an important doctrine in Scripture. So we're going to spend a few, a few moments tonight, start to say a few nights this moment, um, speaking about the, the importance of brotherly love. Father, we thank you that we can be here. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the blood, as we've already mentioned. And I pray, Father, as we go through this message, that you will help teach us and encourage us in the, the concern and care for the brethren. And I pray that you'd help us to distinguish the brethren from all other people. We're to love the world, but there's a special love that Christians are to have to the brethren. And I pray tonight that you'd help us to see that and help us to learn, if we're not doing it already, how to love the brethren fervently. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When you drive up and down the roads, what do you see almost on every street corner anymore if it's not a church? Uh, in this area, we were talk, talking about this past week, uh, we are within a half a mile of two other churches. And we're within two miles of another Baptist church that way and four miles of another church, Baptist, uh, two more Baptist churches that way. Now, not all churches are started for the wrong reasons. I, I don't think I started this church or we started this church for the wrong reason. Uh, God laid it on our hearts. I was at State Line and I was happy at State Line. I loved uh, Brother Cunningham. I had no intention of leaving there, and yet God stirred my soul and stirred my heart and made me start looking for a place in this area up here to, to locate a, an independent, fundamental Baptist church. Not all churches are started that way. Sometimes members will get mad at one another, and it will be over sound doctrine. They, they will separate because they don't agree over doctrine. Well, if it's a, a, an impure doctrine being taught in a church and people want to leave because of that, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, I know a lady who's sitting in this room that left the church one time simply because they went away from the King James Version of the Bible. I applaud her for that. That took some courage. Uh, when we take a stand for the truth, sometimes people will malign us and talk mad about us or, or uh, shun us for one reason or another. That, that's not to be worried about. But sometimes churches separate and other churches are started because there's a difference over what the, the importance of the doctrines are. But more often than that, why are new churches started? Because of what? It, it's petty stuff, like we've mentioned time and again, that, that really in the, in the light of eternity is not going to matter. And people get mad and they'll take a group with them and they'll go down the street and start another church. The two Baptist churches just south of us. One, you can almost, if you had a really good arm, throw a rock and hit the other building. And they started as a split. They got mad at one another and went two miles down or a mile down the road. I guess if you took it the way that you have to drive, it's about a mile. And they started another church. Well, that's no reason to start a church. How, if you've ever driven down in Virginia, anybody ever gone south on Route 29 in Virginia? I'm telling you, when you're going toward Lynchburg from Washington, D.C. area, on, uh, down from uh, 64, is it, Butch? You hit uh, 29 there and go south, you must see 40 churches between the, where you hit uh, 29 and getting into the outskirts of Lynchburg. And you always wonder, why are there so many churches? You know, if people get mad and they get angry, as you're going to, what are you? You're human, you're flesh. Do you ever get upset with somebody? Well, if you said no, I'd know that you're not telling me the truth. There's nobody that has such an even keel that they never get upset about anything. At least nobody I've ever met. They may mask it well, and they may cover it up well, but that doesn't mean that they don't get upset with people. But... If you take that for a reason to go start another church, there's a problem, and you're taking the problem with you instead of solving the problem. A husband and a wife get in a tiff, and the husband doesn't like fighting with the wife, so he brings home candy or flowers and gives them to the wife, and that smooths things over, even though it doesn't take care of the problem. Get the problem out of the way. Get the reason for the spiff out of the way. 
Get the reason for the argument out of the way. Settle. And I know my wife is a sweetheart. I love her to death for her qualities in this respect. She hates confrontations like that. But you know, sometimes it takes a confrontation to get the problem solved. Now, I don't mean that you have to slap one another, cuss one another out, but sometimes you've got to confront the other person and talk it out and get through it. You can't just sweep it under the rug and hope it's going to stay there. Sooner or later, somebody's going to lift the edge of the rug up and say, what's this? <laughs> what's been going on here? And it's usually, I won't say that. Now, that's another message, but it's usually the wife that keeps the score and later on brings it up again. Carolyn's saying no. Okay, so moving right along, we want to talk tonight about this idea of just this purity of brotherly love and this concept of fervent brotherly love. Now, I'm going to say something right off the bat. I was adopted at birth. And sometimes people that are adopted don't appreciate what they had. But I have always thanked God for two things about my adoption. Number one, I had a mother that realized she could not give me the life she wanted me to have, being an unwed mother in 1949. There were not the systems now, then, that there are now. There was not the help uh, available then that the help is available now. Her mom and dad, her dad mostly, had uh, excommunicated her from the family, so she had no family support because back in those days, if daddy excommunicated you, that means all the brothers and sisters also excommunicated you, and they treated you like you were not in it alive. So she loved me enough to realize she couldn't take care of me and she sought out a family who would love me and take care of me. And that family that adopted me is my family. I thank God it was such a tight-knit family. My mom and dad, I think about parents that don't want to spend time with their children in our modern society. You know, uh, back then, my dad took me every place he went if I could go. Uh, I started hunting when I was about four years old. What do you mean? You carried a gun? No, but I'd go out with dad and I'd sit on the log and I'd sit still and be quiet and I'd watch what he did. If he went fishing, I went fishing. He was working on the car, I was working on the car. I thank God that parents back then had tight-knit families to where they included children and made them a part. They knew they were a part. Uh, my mom was the same way. If she went shopping, I had to go shopping. I guess that's why I hate shopping so much today. I've never liked shopping, but she went shopping, she'd take me shopping. She went to church, I went to church. I was one of those drugged kids. I was drugged shopping, and I was drugged to church, and I was drugged to anniversary parties and drugged to relatives' house. But the truth is, I thank God that I had a family that way. And I'm going to say this in all earnestness. I thank God for the close-knit family we have here at Safe Harbor Baptist Church. Now, by and large, we've got a great bunch of people here. Does not mean we're perfect. You can look around and see that we're not perfect or some of the family would be here like they ought to be when we have our family reunions three times a week, but they're not. But I thank God that our family here is close-knit. I cannot tell you the times, especially when Carolyn's uh, mother was sick and her brothers were sick and we would have to leave on a moment's notice and go somewhere like to West Virginia or Virginia or someplace else. And people would come from the church and make sure that we had enough money to go. And they wouldn't come and say, do you have enough money? They would come and give you money. They didn't want you to say, well, no, we're, we'll do it. No, they wanted to make sure that you had extra money to go. I've always appreciated that. When you're sick, these folks in this church want to know when people are sick so they can call, so they can send cards, so they can let people know they care. Uh, when, when people are sick, and I'm going to say this very publicly, and you don't let the preacher know you're sick, I don't know what to do. I pray for you every day as a body. But I don't, if you're not sick and you don't, if you're sick and you don't tell me, I don't know whether you need me to come visit you or not. I, I, I don't read minds. And that may be a shock to some of you women. You think all us men read minds, but we don't. And so the body is closer when we share those times. It's a close-knit family. I appreciate that. So I guess I'm saying to you that brotherly love like it talks about here in verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That love, as it says here, needs to be not just unfeigned, but it needs to be from a pure heart fervently. Fervently. So when we think about loving one another, it needs to be a fervent, not faked, pure type of brotherly love. Um, 
Adam didn't want to hug me this morning, so I made him hug me. Uh, we, we get to the, the portions of scripture that I preached on not long ago where it says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. Uh, I don't want any of you men kissing on me, but the truth is I appreciate it when I get a good firm handshake or even a hug. I don't care if you're male or female. And that doesn't make me one of these. It makes me understand that the word of God says we're to love his brethren. I hugged on my dad till the day he died. I hug on my brother now and then. He's, he's not a hugger, but uh, if, he, if he's available and, and, and I could get one, I would hug him. But the truth is, that, that, that is born into a believer. It should be a hallmark. As big a hallmark as our salvation through the blood and as the absolute inerrancy of the word of God should be a hallmark of our brotherly love, fervent, pure, and unfaked. We could almost say it's part of our DNA. You know, you've heard me say that could you test the blood of Jesus, you would have found that his DNA was unlike anybody else's who, have, who has ever been on the face of the earth. Because the DNA carries most of the markers of the male, is my understanding. And the DNA tells you an awful lot about the parentage. Well, Christ's DNA didn't have any father parentage except the heavenly father's parentage the Holy Spirit's parentage. He didn't have, as I mentioned this morning, an earthly father, Joseph. Mary was conceived by God through the Holy Spirit. And so we see that we have that in our DNA and it should give us an inspiration. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. I'm hurrying because I got a hundred things to tell you in a short time to get them in. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Paul there says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. And, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Now, can I tell you a secret? When I met Gladys and Philip last Sunday morning, there was an instant bond. Not because of their cultural background, and my cultural background came together, uh, it would not have done that. I was born down south. I won't say any more than that. You'll understand what that means. It wasn't because they spoke the same language I speak. I tell you all the time, I speak two languages fluent, fluently, English and hillbilly. I don't speak Swahili or Swahili or whatever it is that they speak. That's not what caused that bond. It was the bond of the love in Jesus Christ. I have met preachers that I did not feel that bond with. I have met missionaries that I don't feel that bond with. Sometimes I've met people that come into our church that I don't feel that bond with. How do you know? Well, you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We get a call about three times a year from a certain individual that always tries to put us on a guilt trip. Uh, he calls and he's always got a sob story, just getting out of the hospital, just had a car wreck, just had this, just had that. We need help, can you give us money? Can you give us finances? My answer to him is no. And I don't ever lose any sleep over telling him no. He's not a brother in Christ. If he was not a brother in Christ but had a real need, I would feel compassion for him. But I don't feel any compassion for people that try to rip the churches off, none, none. Uh, you can ask Carolyn about some of the stories when we went to State Line and, and uh, Pastor Cunningham would have the people come to me and talk to me about helping them. No compassion. No compassion. If you've got a real need, I'll help you. If you've got a put on need, a feigned need, as it talks about here, a fake need, I have no compassion for you. I don't like con artists. I don't like to be con. Don't want our churches to be con. But we have a close knit brotherly love that many times you feel with people that you don't even know that much about. In John chapter 13 and verse 35, Jesus put it this way. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. If I were to tell you this, let me ask it in a question and you answer me. Do we want our church to glorify God? Do you understand then that we are not glorifying God if we don't love the brethren? When we have missionaries come in or uh, evangelists come in or guest speakers of any type come in and we don't do them right by giving as generous an offering as we can to them, are we glorifying God? 
If we half treat them halfway decent, are we glorifying God? No, because brotherly love, as it says, needs to be fervent. Fervent brother. I, and I don't know how to explain this other than from a human standpoint. You remember your first per puppy love experience? How many of you do? Raise your hand. I remember mine, first grade. A girl would attack me from behind or throw her arms around me in a coat room and give me a kiss. First grade. I don't even remember her name, but I thought I was in love. Compare that to the love that you felt after being married for 20 or 30 years to your spouse. That's the difference between a feigned love, not a pure love, and a fervent love for the brethren. Uh, I, I, I guess I can let this cat out of the bag. There's a pretty good possibility that Pete, when he gets married to Mariah in June, shortly after that's coming back here to help us out. Not in a paid position, but he's going to work full time and work at the church too. You know, when he left, the thing that bothered me, and this is on, going to be on internet probably, so he may get to see it, but one of the things that bothered me is you can't get to know the people and fall in love with people in a year's time. These young preachers that go to a church and things don't work out after six months and are looking for another place to serve, what did I tell you this morning about being, planting a blooming where you planted? You, you put down some roots. You put down some roots. My first pastor was three years, and I, I learned a lot in those three years. When God moved me, I was sad to go to the next church. I went from being a pastor to an assistant pastor because that was God's plan, and he moved me in that situation, but I missed those people. It was heartrending for me to leave those people in that first church. Ken Beach, I will never forget. He was the first chairman of a deacon board I ever had to work with. And back then, this was an old, old established church, and the chairman of the deacon board was on the same par as a pastor almost. What he said went. And I got to know him and got to learn a lot. And I knew that if I could win him over to my way of thinking or philosophy, I had it made in the church. He gave me so much just by uh, um, um, osmosis almost, just being around him and listening to him and watching how he handled people. I, I learned so much from him, as well as older people in church. You can't do that in a year's time. You don't fall in love fervently. You don't fall in love. I, I heard about a guy just recently that met a woman on the internet and six weeks later he married her. And I'm thinking to myself, what? What do you know about a person in six weeks? Nothing. You don't know them, and you're going to get married and make a commitment that's supposed to be a lifetime commitment after six weeks? No. So as a church body, I need to make a commitment to put down roots. You need to make a commitment to put down roots. Now, I don't know how it is for you, but I've been here since day one. My roots are really deep at Safe Harbor Baptist Church. If God would decide to move me, it would break my heart. I would do it. If, if I was certain he wanted me to do it. But it would break my heart because I've invested my life in you and you've invested your life in me. We've learned a mutual respect and admiration for one another. I don't expect you to do what you can't do and I try to encourage you to do as much as you can and maybe a little more to broaden your horizons sometimes, huh, Janice? But the truth is, it takes time to get that type of brotherly love. But you do not glorify God if you don't love the brethren. I would also mention to you, it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. I'm going to give you time to get there because some of you are turning, some of you are writing. I don't care which one you do because I'm going to read it. You okay on it? Way back here. Don't go to sleep now because you're back here in that backsliders area. Back here all by yourself. I can see what's going on back. Don't you two start cuddling either. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Okay, here it is. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, as touching things offered to idols, you know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. If we are going to be involved with brotherly love, it will edify the church. Now, what does edify mean? Uh, we lived in Missouri for a good while, and there was a, a uh, river that flowed close to our house. It was the Missouri River, if I'm not mistaken. Was it that went through, uh, what was that town over there? The Merrimack, that's it. Merrimack River. And almost every year, 
it would flood. And you know what people would start doing when it came time and that river started going up? They started sandbagging. They started sandbagging with plastic, trying to keep the water out of the low-lying areas. Now, it didn't always work, but they were taking an edification stance. They were trying to fortify or protect their property. Listen, if we love the brethren like we ought to, it will edify the church. It will build the church stronger. When those little leaks in the dike start, when somebody gets their nose out of joint, brotherly love overlooks that kind of thing. Not that it's all, I, I won't even say it's all petty. Sometimes somebody will say something to you that really cuts to the quick. And it's easy in the flesh to want to re respond to that. Brotherly love, if it's fervent, plugs that hole in the dike real quickly. And you remind yourself, well, Jesus had much worse done and said to him, and I'm his disciple, so I can expect as bad or worse than he had. And so we overlook a lot of that. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin, and that's what it means. We get to the point where we allow God to give us some strength. It also tells us in Colossians 3.14... It says, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. If you want your life to be more perfect than it's ever been before, love people more than you've ever loved them before. It builds a perfection in you. It helps to take off the rough edges. How do I mean that? Well, do you ever have a quick, sharp tongue? How many of you will admit it? Raise your hands. When you get to that point that you're aggravated and your tongue wants to be sharp and quick, love, brotherly love, fervent, pure, unfaked brotherly love will temper that sharp tongue. If we put our mind in gear and our heart in gear before our mouth's put in motion, it will temper that sharp tongue. Uh, can I use you as an illustration, Carolyn? We have this big dog, his name's Roscoe, and he stays most of his time outside, but lately he's been coming in at night. <clears throat> and when the other dogs were uh, not with us anymore, uh, when they were gone, we decided to let Roscoe sleep run of, run of the house in the evening when we bring him in. So we bring him in, and Carolyn always gives him two snack treats, little bones about that big. And man, he loves them. He just almost swallows them whole, and he, he wants more. So sometimes if Carolyn has a headache or she's real tired, last night Roscoe came after and had his two treats and almost climbed in her lap, licked her on the arm, and she was irritated. She said, do you remember what she said, Carolyn? Yeah, but how did you say it? Can you repeat it how you said it to him? Get out of here and lay down. <laughs> Poor Roscoe went over on the floor, dropped his head and laid down on the rug. Carolyn says, come here, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have talked to you like that. Now you say, well, that's just a dog. Yeah, but how many times do we talk to people and we don't apologize about it? Love puts that sharp tongue under control. So we need to practice brotherly love because it'll help show your maturity. That bond of perfectness it's talking about. Perfect means mature in the scriptures. It doesn't mean that everything you do or think or say is going to be right. The fourth thing I would mention to you here is brotherly love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here because I already mentioned it. When you love fervently, you overlook the faults in other people. You give them room to be human. And you've heard me say this. If you haven't, you ought to write it down. This is a good, good lesson in one phrase. If you, give your, if you give other people room to be human... When the time comes, they may give you room to be human also. We get so critical of other people. Well, they shouldn't have acted that way. And then you act that way and you expect them to just forget it and not worry about it. No, 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 no. What did Jesus say? Judge not that you be not judged. For in like manner as you judge, you shall be meted to you again. Something to that effect. That means it's going to come back on. Uh, Rebecca has this bad habit of talking about karma. I'm leaving it to karma. Karma's going to take it. Well, karma is a Hindu false teaching, uh, false uh, religious teaching. Karma means that what goes around comes around. We've all heard that saying. Hey, that's not the way it works. But if you don't give people room to be human, they're not going to give you room to be human. Love says, I understand that they're not always on their, their best game, and I'm not always on my best game. 
And so when we think about that, we need to learn some lessons. I'm going to give you some lessons now. This is different from the other four that I just gave you. So start again. Number one, brotherly love must be carefully mo- uh, cultivated. First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7. And it says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. You would think it would come natural. And reality, it will if you're growing and maturing as a Christian as you should. But if you see that you're not very tolerant with other people and you don't appreciate them simply for what God appreciates them for, if you're not willing to love them like Jesus loves them, how many of you have heard me say Jesus doesn't love you any more today than he did yesterday? He doesn't love you any less when you're backslidden than he does when you're saved and you're living a good life for God. When you're on the top of the mountain, he loves you just the same as he does when you're in the valley. That's how we're supposed to love people. That type of brotherly love. But as touching brotherly love, you have need not that I write unto yourselves, for yourselves are taught, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Number two, brotherly love must have a fertile growing place. This is important. First Timothy 1.5 says, And now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. How do you love people like you should when your heart's right with God? When we're out of fellowship with God, we're not in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we're on edge and we're convicted because we're sinning and we're not doing what God wants us to do ourselves, that puts us on edge with everybody else. How many of you have ever heard the the saying, uh, you are are more uh, critical of the faults that you find in others that, be, that are your faults. When you see your faults in somebody else, you're very critical about them. You know that's true? Because you're so on edge about it because you know it's not right in your life that you become even cr- more critical with the other people when you see it in their life. But we have to have a pure heart if that, if that is going to grow. Um, a few years back, I guess it's been three years now, the, the farmer next door to us asked me if I wanted some mushroom soil. So I said, yeah. So he brought a, a uh, fertilizer spreader, manure spreader, a big manure spreader, backed it up to my field and ran that thing till it was empty. And I had a pile of, of mushroom soil about four feet high and about eight feet long. I didn't know what to do with it all. So I just started spreading it here and there best I could. I couldn't get it, you know, spread like I would want it. It was just in a big pile. So I got my front end loader on my debt tractor and went in there and I'd ride down the, the, the field and bump it just a little bit and let a little bit scatter here and there. Becca came in last year, I think it was, and she says, I just picked some mushrooms out back. Do you want them? And I'm thinking, well, you know, if they came out of that mushroom soil, they're probably okay, but I'm not an expert on mushrooms, so I said, no, throw them away. Don't bring any more mushrooms in here. Why did the mushrooms grow in mushroom soil? That's what it's made for. And no matter how long it had been there, there were still apparently some spores of that mushroom still in that mushroom soil, and they grew. I don't know how to tell you any, any better way. You've got to have a heart full of mushroom soil if you want your love to grow right. You understand what I'm telling you? You can't love right if your heart's not right. If your heart's not right in our faith, you can't love other people like we should. That brotherly love won't be there. Uh, Something else very quickly, let me go on. Number three, brotherly love has to be constantly worked at and maintained. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul says there, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Follow after means you got to keep working at it. When you think you've arrived and you love everybody like you should and you start to let down your guard, you're not going to be loving everybody like you should. That means we constantly look for ways to show our love to each other. Uh, There's a a philosophy of counseling. When a husband and wife have a problem, as I mentioned a while ago, And the husband thinks he's going to be able to solve the problem by giving a gift. You may start out up here as a great big circle where the problem doesn't 
come about very often. But then the next time a little problem comes, she's going to buy another gift. The next time a problem comes, another gift and another gift and another gift and another gift. And without realizing it, what he's doing is encouraging the problem to keep surfacing instead of solving it. And it becomes a downward spiral. That problem needs to be solved. So if you're not constantly working on it and maintaining it, when, when you want to do something nice for your wife, what should you do, Rich? Do it. You have an instinct to do something. Don't wait until there's a problem to take your wife flowers. Take her flowers now. Amen, Autumn? If you want to be sweet to your wife, take her out to dinner now. Amen, Sherry? If you want to show her you love her, do something now. Right, Janice? We don't wait until there's a problem and then use that as our parachute to get out of the problem. You have to maintain love. The same is true in a church situation. Why don't we begin to look for people in an attitude and eyes of love and a heart of brotherly love where we can find things to do for other people unexpected without trying to get anything in return just because we know that they would like it or appreciate it, right? Pick somebody out in the church. Go over here to Giant, buy them a $25 gift card to a restaurant. Put their name on their envelope, lay it on the back table, and don't even tell them who it's from. Why? Just because you want to show love. Find somebody that maybe doesn't have as much as you have. Get them some baskets or a bag of groceries and just drop it off to them and just tell them you love them and that's why you're doing it. Don't expect anything in return. If you can do it without even being recognized so that they pat you on the back, do it that way. Just keep looking for ways to maintain and work at that brotherly love. And then the fourth thing I would say to you, and there's one or two more here, one more. The fourth thing is brotherly love must be our motivation for fellowship. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Now, you remember 1 Corinthians was written to a church with absolutely no problems, right? No, they had many problems, and basically they were immature and they were divided into schisms and they were not fellowshipping together in unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says, let all your things be done with charity. Whatever we do, let it be because of charity, our motivation. Why do preachers preach if they have the right motivations because they love the Lord and they love their people? I, I know preachers sometimes preach because they love the Lord and they don't care a thing about the people. They need to quit. They need to go get an honest job selling cars or get their heart right to where they love the people like they should. Uh, I think that that's the motivation for everything we do. Uh, when Carolyn teaches... And she's over there teaching quite often. Most every time somebody doesn't show up or there's a problem, she's over there teaching Sunday morning. Uh, it used to be Sunday morning uh, in Sunday school, Sunday morning junior church, Wednesday night in the, the kids' program over there. Uh, why, why did she do that? Because I've got a yardstick in there. It's made out of oak. No. She did it because she loves the kids. Now, it was hard for us to make a decision not to run the van on Wednesday night. But there just comes a point where one person can't do everything. There's got to be some other people in the church somewhere that could say, I, I love those kids enough that for one hour a week I could take them on. I could take that on as a ministry. We could start to van up as far as I know this coming Wednesday night. Could we not, Autumn? If we had somebody to teach the kids. I've got a van driver willing to do it. But we don't have a teacher for the kids. And think about this. Wednesday night, we were getting more kids on the van than we were on Sunday morning. But there just wasn't anybody to teach and, and to fall into that position. Uh, if you think a pastor's wife's job is easy, follow my wife around for a week. Listen as I do as she talks to people on the phone. Out of our church and outside of our church, it has problems. Watch her as she prepares and teaches and takes care of me, takes care of other people, and still has the energy to go and teach that many times a week. And I'm not doing that so you pat her on the back. I, I love her, and I appreciate all she does, and I know the Lord does. But my purpose in saying that is to say somebody ought to love those kids enough to be able to step forward and say, I could teach those kids for one hour a week. I could teach those kids. I could do it. 
Uh, I, I may not always enjoy all those kids all the time. Well, I guarantee you never will. If you've ever taught primary boys, you know that's the truth. There are times you just soon hang them by their heels up on the side of the wall and go ahead and teach the rest of the class and, let, and then let them down. But somebody needs to love them. Little Connor, somebody needs to love little Connor. Now, he's a mess. He's not only a mess, how you say it, Autumn? He's a hot mess. But he needs somebody to love him. He, he made me feel so good this morning. I was over in the trailer in the fellowship hall when he came in. And everybody else was getting hugs from Carolyn. He bypassed them and come running to get a hug from me. Now, why does he want a hug from me? He loves me because I loved him first. When he was giving us so many fits, I'd get him aside and I'd hug on him and tell him I loved him and the Lord loved him. And God may make him a preacher. And he's still saying, no, you the preacher. Yeah, but you may be the preacher in the next few years. We don't know. Somebody needs to love him. And fifthly, I got to hurry. Let me throw this in under brotherly love, love must be our motivation. First Peter 5.14 says, greet one another with a kiss of charity, peace with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, I don't need you guys kissing on me, but that brotherly love needs to be there. Uh, number five, brotherly love must be consistent among the members. You, we, we, I say this, we don't have cliques in our church that I know of. We don't have a little group that constantly gets together. Now, somebody made a comment in my, in my uh, presence the other day that really I got righteously indignant over. They insinuated that some of the decisions that were made by our ladies' group were made by just a few women in the ladies' group. And I know that when I walk out of that room, I see this whole side full of women. And what you discuss, I understand, is given by popular demand. In other words, you vote on what you want to do. Is that not right? Yeah. Is there any dictators over there? Well, I, I got righteously irritated to the point, you know what I had to do? I had to shut my mouth before I said something I'd regret. I don't want us to have cliques. We've never tried to have cliques. Uh, I go out to eat with people in the church when I'm invited. Somebody says to me, well, how come you always go out to eat with Ruth Little? Because she invites me out to eat. Why don't I go out to eat with you? You don't invite me out to eat. <laughs> Simple as that. I'm not a respecter of persons when it comes to food especially. You want to go out to eat with me? Let's go. Kathleen and I have been out to eat. Shirley and, and Gloria and Carol and I went out to eat one night. I don't think Rich ever invited me out there. Oh, yeah, I did. We went over to his house to eat one night, didn't we? A couple times. Huh? I got sick? Well, we went one time over his house. Well, what are you waiting on? Hey, I can handle my diet. You just, you just want us to eat? You just invite me. I'll show you how well I can handle my diet. Enough said. But you get the concept about brotherly love? Folks, you know, sometimes people, I, I get criticized. And, and I don't mind it. I get criticized. If this is the worst criticism I ever get, it will never bother me. I get criticized because I joke too much from the pulpit. You know why we have that relationship in this church? Because we love each other. How do you get by teasing people like you do? How do you tease Gene mercilessly like you do? How did you tease Joe Houston when he was alive like you do? Because they know I love them. I don't think I've ever made Gene mad, have I, Gene? No, and I don't think I ever made Joe mad. And I mean, I, 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 I picked on Joe a whole lot worse than I've ever picked on Gene. I pick on Rich. Do I ever make you mad, Rich? Why? Because we know we like, you guys pick on me. And I pick on Fran. And Fran knows I love her. We, we, if, if I hurt your feelings, if you tell me I'm going to apologize and quit picking on you, if I, can, if I can work it and get my flesh under control that much in that situation. But I'm telling you, this matter of brotherly love, what did we say it was penned between? Here's three sticky notes up on God's whiteboard. One of them says the precious blood of Christ. The one on this side says the precious inspiration of the word of God uh, that is uncorruptible. And right in the middle is the brotherly love. So why don't we spend more time thinking about how we show that to one another? Let brotherly love continue. Now remember what he said, unfeigned, that means not faked, out of a pure heart and fervently, fervently love each other. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you've shown to us. May we glorify you as we love one another.